I want to talk for a moment from this subject, hallelujah, anyhow. No matter what my circumstance, no matter what situation I'm in, no matter how dire my straits, hallelujah, anyhow. The name Habakkuk means to wrestle or to embrace, to wrestle. Habakkuk, not much is known about him from the scripture. He has a, a small writing in the Old Testament, only three chapters. Not much is known about him, not much is given about him, save his name. For Habakkuk represents the many of us here this morning who loves God, but we've had some doubts. We trust God, but it gets hard sometimes. We believe his word, but the situation seems otherwise. We know he's there, but we can't always find him. We know he lives, but situations sometimes crowd in on us, and it looks like God is not paying attention. Habakkuk means to wrestle. Uh, Jacob wrestled with God. And a faith that's worth having is a faith that's worth wrestling over. I don't always understand God. I don't always know what God is up to. And, and I struggle with that as a Christian because I know in whom I have believed. And I know that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. But still as his child, as his, as his son, as, as one of his servants, there are times when I question what it is that he's doing. And I question not because God can't handle my questions, because God is not intimidated by my questioning of him. You have to have a really weak faith if you don't have some questions. Why are good people struggling and people who don't even go to church never have a headache? Why is it that that people who are trying to give God their best never seem to get the upper hand and people who don't mean anybody any good are always riding high. Sometimes life crowds in on you and for many people life can become too much for you and it doesn't matter how much money you have doesn't matter how famous you are. It doesn't matter how many people know who you are. Sometimes life can become too much for you. It happened to Kate Spade last week. It happened to Anthony Bourdain last week. And, and the suicide rate has gone up 30% in the last 10 years in this country across socioeconomic strata across educational lanes, across race and culture. Some people just can't handle it anymore. Uh, and, they, and they think that the best way to handle it is to get out of it. They don't want to die, they just want to get out of the pain that they're in. Because the pain sometimes can become almost unbearable. That's where Habakkuk is in the text. And when you read Habakkuk chapter number one, 
He's in turmoil. He's in turmoil because of the double enigma of divine providence. And the double enigma of divine providence is that the people of God are sinning a great sin and God is not doing anything about it. That's, that's, that's one part of his dilemma. And then the other side of the dilemma is that God takes a nation worse than his own people to judge his people. Somebody ought to help me preach it. That the people are sinning and it looks like God is not going to do anything about it and then God takes somebody worse than the people sinning and he judges them by this heathen nation. Jehoiakim is the king and uh, Babylon has already overthrown Nineveh and now God is using a heathen like Babylon to overthrow his own people. Kind of like what's going on in the United States right now. The, the, the election of Donald Trump to the highest office in this land was not an accident. God may be using Trump to discipline this nation. He may have raised up a heathen to point out to us that if my people, I wish I had a witness, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from that wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven, not when the president speaks, not when the governor speaks, not when the mayor speaks, but when the people of God take their rightful place, then God will become God again. In, in chapter one, he's in turmoil. And in his turmoil, he says to God, how long will I cry and you not hear me? In turmoil, he says something. But then in chapter two, he leaves the turmoil of chapter one and he goes to a watchtower. He leaves the turmoil and he goes to pitch himself in a tower. And he said, God, I'm going to stay right here and watch to see how you're going to work this thing out. I said all I had to say in chapter number one. Now, I'm going to sit down here in this tower in chapter two and watch you to see how you're going to work it out. And in chapter two, God says, write the vision. I wish I had a Bible reading and make it plain. It shall speak and it shall not lie. I'm going to show you how I'm going to get glory out of the judgment of these people. I'm going to show you, Habakkuk, how I can take your doubts and turn them into shouts. And somebody ought to help me testify. If you've been walking with the Lord for a while, if you've been trusting God in the midst of your situation, if you've been watching God move stumbling blocks and obstacles and open doors and answer prayers and dry tears and help you raise your children and put food on your table and make a way out of no way and heal your body, God can turn your doubts into shouts. I need a shouter here who used to be a doubter here who can help me testify if you trust and never doubt. He will surely bring you out. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. He will provide. He will 
will make a way. He will pick you up. He will stop you from crying. He will make a way out of no way. He will be a mother for you. He'll take back what the devil stole from you. Have I got a witness here? He'll put shoes on your feet. He'll put clothes on your back. God will. But you got the right division. Make it plain. And it shall speak and not lie. I was, um, I, was, I was teaching in teaching teachers meeting on this past Friday night. Uh, and I mentioned it. Growing up as a, as, a, as a child in my little church where I was raised and baptized and preached my first sermon and pastored for 10 years, uh, I could tell when I was really preaching. Uh, I, I didn't have much to say. I was just a little scribbling. Uh, 95 pounds soaking wet, but I could tell when I was really preaching. Because uh, uh, Miss, Miss Lavinia Van, uh, over on my right side, would say, make it plain, Reverend. I knew I was really preaching there. And, and then if I was kind of slipping off it, uh, Brother Albert Hayes over on the other side, We'll say, help him, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Some preacher ought to help me right here. Uh, I, I really knew I was getting after it when Miss Van said, make it plain, Reverend. And, and, and the gospel, the word, the preaching ought to be made plain so that people can know that whatever you're going through, you don't have to get out of this world for God to bring you out. Have I got a witness here? Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me try to get this over to you without, without shouting. There, there, there is a load-bearing beam in this text that rests perpendicularly to a ceiling joist. That's, that's, that's construction talk for you who, who, who don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, that, that's a load-bearing beam that sits perpendicularly to a ceiling joist in this text. That, that if the beam gives way, the whole construction comes down. And, and the joist in the text, the ceiling joist, the ceiling in this text is the word although. Although, but, 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 but the load-bearing beam in the text is the word, yet. If the load-bearing beam gives way, the whole construction in the text will come down. Although, the fig tree will not blossom. Yet, somebody ought to help me. <laughs> Although there's no fruit on the vine, yet. Although there's no cattle in the stall, yet. Although I'm broke, yet. Although I got a bad diagnosis from the doctor, Yet, although my child is in jail, yet, although I'm the only one left in my family, yet, although my body is getting weak and I can't do what I used to do, yet, will I praise God. Somebody ought to help me testify. Although there be no cattle in the stall, although there be no blossom in the fig tree, 
Yes! I'm going to say hallelujah anyhow. Although it looks dark. Yeah. I'm going to get up on Sunday morning. Put some clothes on. And come to God's house. And say though you slay me. Yet. Will I put my trust in you. All the day. Of my appointed time. I'm going to wait. Till my change comes. I'm troubled on every side. Yet, not in distress. Perplexed, yet not in despair. Persecuted, yet not forsaken. Cast down, yet not destroyed. Whatever's going on in my although, thank God for my yet. Every believer here this morning got an although and a yet. Although it don't look good. Yet, I'm going to get in this tower and wait. And watch. And tell God is on you. My eyes are on you. What you gonna do? Prove yourself. Show yourself faithful. And you know what God will do? God will come in the middle of your situation and turn the battle in your faith. Somebody ought to help me testify. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. You got to be strong. You got to stand up. You got to look at the devil in the eye. You got to look at your enemy square in their face. And then you got to remember what scripture says. Fret not yourself. Because of evil doers. Don't be envious against the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut off like grass. The Lord is my light. And my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh just before they got to me, they stumbled and they fell. Though a host should surround me and a camp against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Here it is for in the time of trouble in the time of trouble he shall hide me When, when, when you trust God, your enemies can see you, but they can't get their hands on you. They want you, but they can't stop you from being blessed. They mad with you, but you're still going up. They looking at you, 
but they got to look up at you. Because he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil so that my cup is running over. I want you to see one or two things in the text. Um, his sovereignty never changes. His sovereignty never changes. Um, I may not be able to rejoice in my situation. But I can rejoice in my sovereign. Brothers and sisters, hear me. This is, this, is, this, is, this, this is worth the price of the ticket to get in here this morning. Listen, listen to me. Um, what you have to go through next cannot be compared to what you've already overcome. What you have to go through next cannot be compared to what you have to overcome. I was in, I was in Mississippi preaching and I was staying at this hotel and uh, there's a military base nearby and some, some, some Marines were there at the hotel after having done some drills. They came back to the hotel and they were sitting around talking to each other and they were not talking to me, I was just passing by. And I noticed one of the, the Marines had a, a t-shirt on and on that t-shirt, was, was a phrase, a word that, that stopped me in my tracks and I almost shouted right there. They were not talking to me. They were talking to one another, but he had a t-shirt on and the t-shirt made me stop and almost shout. And, and the words on that t-shirt was, pain is weakness leaving your body. Pain is weakness leaving your body. I was talking to somebody who knows that when you do strength training, now you can look at me and tell I don't do no strength training, but I was talking to somebody who knows that when you do strength training, it causes your muscles to ache. But after a while, the ache goes away because that muscle is now so strong that it'll never hurt again in that place. Because if you pick up a hundred pounds, after a while, a hundred pounds don't bother you. So then you move on to 175 pounds. And then after a while, 175 pounds is not enough for you. Then you pick up 200 pounds. And after you've mastered the 200, you move on to 250 pounds because the more weight you pick up, the more weight you are able to pick up. You see where I'm trying to go? The more God sends you through trials and pains and setbacks and heartbreaks and disappointment and tears and, and days where you don't know how you're going to make it. After you come through that, you got strength in the broken places. Some of us here, some of us here have been through so much that we can't turn back now. God's been so good that we wouldn't take nothing for our journey now. God has opened so many doors that you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. He's opened too many doors. He's made too many waves. He's dried too many tears. He's answered too many prayers. So I said to the devil, whatever you're going to bring, come on with it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We are more, more, more than conquerors through him that loved us. Uh, brothers and sisters, his sovereignty 
never changes. Seasons change. People change. But his sovereignty never changes. Then as I hurry, his salvation never ceases. His sovereignty never changes and his salvation never ceases. God is always looking for an opportunity to save. God wants to save you even more than you want to be saved. And then God sometimes saves you even before you know you're saved. It's called theologically election. God just picked you out. He, he, just, he just went to the trash bin. He, he just went to the dump and just picked you out. I know you look good this morning. I know you're all dressed up and your face is all made up and, and you got some nice clothes on, but God went to the dump and just picked you out. He could have left you there. Somebody ought to help me preach here. But he picked you out. He, he elected you. He adopted you. He just took you home with him. Not because there was anything about you that was different from anybody else. He just chose you. I don't understand a Christian who can't shout over salvation. I don't understand a believer who can't give God glory over salvation. It's not of your works. Come on, help me preach here. Salvation is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No one of us in here got any reason to look down on any of the rest of us in here because there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it behooves each of us not to talk about the rest of us. He, he, his salvation never ceases and it never ceases to amaze me why God saved me because brothers and sisters those of you who can help me right here there is nothing in my background that says I ought to be where I am right now Nothing. My, 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 my mom and daddy did, didn't go to college. My grandmother wasn't educated. My grandfather was an alcoholic. My grandparents on my mama's side could hardly speak English. They were so Creole. My daddy and my mama married when my mama was 17 years old and pregnant. Nothing in my background says I ought to be where I am right now. There's no preacher on my family on either side. God just decided to pick me up out of the dump that I was born in. Is there anybody else here? Know that it was nobody but the Lord on your side because there's nothing in your history that says you ought to be blessed this morning. It's of the Lord's mercy that you are not consumed. And those mercies are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness because his salvation never ceases. That means once God saves you, he can keep you saved. You, you will be manipulated by the devil. You will be stimulated by the devil. You will be motivated by the devil. You will be activated by the devil. But the devil will never be able to possess you again. Because once God saves you, there is a sign over your soul 
that says under new management. And even when I don't feel saved, somebody ought to help me. I know I'm saved. Even when I don't act saved, I know I'm saved. Because he said, he that I hold in my hand, the devil in hell can't pluck him out. I am sealed to the day of redemption. The blood still works. It reaches to the highest mountain. Flows to the lowest valley. That blood that gives me strength from day to day to day to day to day it will never lose its power. Now your salvation is only as good as the one who secures it. I said, your salvation is only as good as the one who secures it. The money you have in the bank is, is secured by the FDIC, uh, the, the, the Federal Deposit uh, Insurance Corporation or whatever that is. Uh, they, 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 they secure your money. Uh, if, if you don't have any, then you ain't got nothing to worry about right now. But, but if you have any money in the bank, it is secured uh, by the FDIC. But, but the country could go broke, like happened in the Great Depression. Uh, we, we could lose the value of the dollar, and the market could crash, and all that you have could be reduced to nothing because your securities, your deposits are only as good as the one who secures it. You have the, the, the faith and trust of the United States banking system, but that could fail in the morning. But thank God, my soul is anchored in the Lord. My salvation is deep in the Lord. I am his and he is mine. God sent Jesus to save me and Jesus died for my sins, rose for my justification, went back to the Father, is seated on the right hand of power and sent the Holy Spirit to secure my salvation. So his word says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. His sovereignty never changes. His salvation never ceases. But as I hurry to the close, his strength never collapses. It's right here in the text. Habakkuk says, I'm going to stay here. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to watch and see what you're going to do. And then God says, well, write it down. Because I'm getting ready to show you who I am. And then when you leave the turmoil and the tower of chapters one and two, you go to the triumph of chapter number three. And in chapter number three, it's a prayer. Uh, Habakkuk is praying in chapter three, but, but it is not a prayer for deliverance because God already promised that in chapter two, but it's a prayer of thanksgiving and rejoicing. Because there are three verses in chapter three that has the word behind it that we find in the book of Psalms. The word, Selah. 
Read it, read it, read it when you get home. Just read the prayer when you get home. He, he, he writes a phrase or two, and then he puts Selah. Then he writes another verse of three or four, and then he writes Selah. And then he writes another verse or two, and then he writes Selah. Which means after he thinks about God's goodness, that word Selah means stop a minute and shout. Stop a while, pause, and praise. When was the last time you paused to praise? I'm not talking about in church on Sunday morning. Because everybody can praise on Sunday morning. But I'm talking about getting in that car tomorrow morning. And you don't have enough gas to make it to the week. And you don't get paid till Friday. But God lets that car keep running. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Till you get paid on Friday. You ought to pause right now. And praise. The doctor said, we've done all we can do. We're going to try an experimental drug. It may work and it may not work. But here you are this morning, fat and fine. Looking good and feeling well. I think you ought to pause and praise. That's not enough for you? Look back about 25 or 30 years ago. And see where you were and how you were feeling and how down you were and how messed up you were and how tore up you were but God got you on your feet sanctified you and forgave you took all your sins away blotted out all the mistakes you made look at how good you look now girl it was nobody but Jesus you ought to pause and pray. But then he finishes. Because really, when he gets through, chapter three is music. It's a congregational song. Because Habakkuk says, give, th give this music, give this song to the choir director so he can score it to stringed instruments. I think I told you before that the reason why Satan hates us so much is because the instruments he used to use to praise God when he was Lucifer God has given to us since he became Satan. Let me run that by you one more time. The reason why the devil don't want you to come to church is because the instruments he used to use as Lucifer, the bright sun of the morning, when he fell like lightning from heaven, God took his instruments and gave them to us since he became Satan. And the instruments that he used to use were wind instruments. That's breath. Percussion instruments. That's clapping your hand. But stringed instruments, that's using your vocal cords. And since God has been good to you, and God has brought you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, it's time for you to put out your instruments and use them to make the devil mad. Use your percussion instruments. Use your wind instruments. But for God's sake, use your string instruments. Use your voice. God don't just want you clapping your hand. God don't just want you to nod your head. God doesn't just want you to shed tears. God wants you to open your mouth and tell him thank you. I'm trying to quit here. I'm trying to leave it alone. But the strength of the Lord never collapses. 
And sometimes we sing songs in church and we've been singing them so long that they don't mean anything to us anymore. But, but I think we ought to sing with new meaning. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. When my strength starts to fail, brothers and sisters, God is right there. And I'm underneath his love. His, his wings are there to protect and to guide. And, and so I want you to leave here this morning knowing that no matter what you're going to come up against tomorrow here in Houston, God's sovereignty never changes. No matter what's going to happen to you in your finances or in your health, his salvation never ceases. No matter how old age creeps up on you and, and you can't see as far as you used to see, you can't walk as long as you used to walk, God's strength never collapses. Is there anybody here know God is still able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can even ask or think? Is there anybody here knows that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered the hearts of men the good things that God has in store for them who love him. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. Is there anybody here can help me testify that weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning if you be not weary in well doing in due season, you will reap if you faint not. If the Lord open doors for you and you're not embarrassed to testify if the Lord put clapping in your hand if the Lord answered your prayers you ought to help me pause a minute and give God some praise if the Lord drowned your tears you ought to pause a minute and give God some praise if the Lord helping you stand up under your pressure pause a minute and give God some praise if God made a way for you and you got a job in the morning pause and give God some praise if you got a roof over your head pause and give God some praise if you got clothes in your closet pause and give God some praise if you got transportation this morning, pause and give God some praise. If the Lord made a way out of no way, pause and give him some praise. If you got to get out in the aisle because the folk don't want you praising all over them, don't want you shouting all on them, 
Don't want you falling all over. Just get on out in the aisle if you have to. And say, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what God has done for me. You can tell what God has made a way for me. You don't know why I shout so much. Let me tell you why I cry so much. Let me tell you why I praise God so much. Let me tell you why I love God so much. Let me tell you why I raise my hand so much. I almost let go. I felt like I just couldn't take it anymore. My problems had me bound. Depression weighed me down. But God held me close and he wouldn't let go. I almost gave up. I was right at the edge of a breakthrough, but I couldn't see it. The devil really had me, but Jesus came and grabbed me. He held me close and he wouldn't let go. I'm here today because God kept me. alive today only because God kept me is there anybody here no God kept you why don't you hug somebody why don't you encourage somebody tell them I'm here today I'm here today because God kept me I'm alive today because God kept me, I know he's all right. Won't he hold you? Won't he keep you? Won't he provide for you? Tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know he's on. will not blossom. Although there's no fruit on the vine. Although there's no cattle in the stone. Yet I will rejoice. Hear me beloved. I know it looks bad. But you can praise your way out of it. I, I know it looked like it ain't gonna ever turn around. But you can praise your way out of it. I know it looks like it's the last quarter. But you can praise your way out of it. Because he is my strength. And he is become my son. He's a strong top. He's a battle axe. He's a way maker. He's a burden bearer. He's a heart fixer. He's a mind regulator. He's a bridge over troubled water. He's Adam's redeemer and Abel's vindicator, Abraham's sacrifice and Noah's ark. He's, 
He's a root out of a dry ground. Everything you need is in Jesus Christ.